So a little later than I intended, my final piece of talking about Dune and the adaptations thereupon. Finally, it's time to talk about Frank Herbert's Dune, the three-part, four-and-a-half-hour miniseries that aired on the Sci-Fi Channel. I believe, actually, back when it was still spelled like a real word. So... I, I wanted to get this one done actually before the new movie came out, but uh, I, di- I did I did two stupid things. I didn't look into where it was streaming. I assumed it was going to be streaming somewhere, found out it wasn't, ordered a copy, waited for it to come uh, to me from Amazon. And while I was waiting for that, someone pointed out to me that all three episodes have actually been uploaded to YouTube. And apparently whoever owns the copyright doesn't care enough to bother having them taken down. So I could have watched it at any moment for free. I am an idiot, but I have now seen it. So let's talk about this thing. A couple things right off the bat. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the effects too much because I think in terms of the sets, the effects, the action scenes, the scope and the rest of it, it did about as well as it was going to do at the time it was made for TV miniseries money. So I don't feel like picking on that really makes much sense. I did harp on the special effects from David Lynch's Dune a little bit because I don't think a lot of them were up to snuff even for the time, for the kind of budget that it had. This this is really quite on par with what you could have expected for this kind of budget for a TV project. So it's pretty decent as far as that goes. There are some very strange things about this adaptation. I'm not going to recount the plot again um, on on this thing, so I am assuming that you've either read the book or you've seen this miniseries. I'm just going to plow forward. You would assume, if you had four and a half hours, that that would mean you would have to trim very, very little. You could have almost everything. And there are, in fact, some things here that I have not seen in other adaptations. Things like the dinner scene where the smugglers and um, and Dr. Kind sort of give a little bit more information, which was a scene I actually quite liked in the book because I thought it was a well-done uh, exposition scene for the style of book that it was. But it has not been in other a- adaptations, which you wouldn't. It's strictly an exposition scene. That's the kind of thing that you find a way to streamline or cram into other stuff. Um, but that was here. But other things are still like oddly absent or truncated or otherwise altered. Sort of the big one for me, um, Thufir Hawat is almost completely absent from this adaptation, which is very weird to me. There's things like the shields and the way that knife fighting and how Paul knows how to do that is done, which gets mentioned at the front end and we have his training fight with Gurney with the shields. But the shields never come up again after that. They're mentioned offhandedly once as being around the city, but no combat after this ever involves the shields. So it's weird that they kept it when it has zero presence anywhere else in the entire thing. Uh, The acting is, again, decent for the kind of thing that it is. I actually want to highlight Paul a little bit. I don't think the actor who played Paul was particularly amazing. I think he was, he was fine. <laughs> that basically is, is, is what it boils down to. He was fine. But I think a lot of the way that he was written and the way he was directed actually does a much better job of, of painting Paul's rise to power as something dangerous, as something to be afraid of which is something that the Lynch movie didn't really do at all. He was treated incredibly messianically in that one. And the new one we won't really know until we get the second half, which thankfully has been confirmed. So uh, it, I can't know for certain how it's going to pan out there, but this definitely compared to the Lynch does give that weight of him being this powerful is dangerous. And it gives that sense of ominousness to his rise to power. And I was actually quite impressed to see that. It's the kind of thing that I would hope we're going to see in the next uh, Dune movie, but we're just going to have to wait and see. But it was nice to see it here. There is uh, another (laughs) adaptation choice that I get, but also it's kind of like, so there is uh, kind of a, a, a common problem with most of these adaptations, and that has to do with two particular characters who have kind of similar problems. 
One is the princess, the emperor's daughter, and the other is Fade. Now, the way, well, let's back up. The reason that these characters are problems is because the kinds of characters they are and the way that they're used really only works on the page in a novel format. Because with the princess, as I noted in my original review of the book, she only factors into the very, very end of the thing. But we still feel her presence and get a sense of her as a character because of the tiny excerpts from her later writings about the events we're watching unfold now. It's a trick that works very well on the page and doesn't really have an adaptation equivalent in a visual medium like film or television. Now, Lynch's uh, approach to try and give her some weight was to just have her exposition dump at the camera for four minutes. What this decides to do is to actually expand her character significantly. And that is also kind of tied to Fade. Now, the reason Fade is a difficult adaptation thing is because Fade is, he's not a final boss. He's an end note. He is a part of the denouement. He is part of tying up loose ends. It's honestly a little bit like the Battle of the Five Armies in The Hobbit. It's not really the climax to the story that we've been building to. In the case of The Hobbit, that climax was the confrontation with and then the death of Smaug. And everything that happens after that is just us resolving everything that's left to be dealt with. And in the case of Dune, Fade is a character who's been built up and he was really key to the Baron's plan, but by the time this fight happens, Paul is so OP, there's no tension in it, and Fade has so little direct interaction with the story as a whole that he doesn't feel like a proper presence. And again, the book gets away with that better because you don't necessarily get the sense from a book that a final physical fight or an action scene is the climax of it. But in visual mediums like TV and film, that is very much ingrained in us, that the final fight is the climax of a film or a TV show if it has an action uh, element to it. And that's simply not what Fade is. And I am also going to be very curious to see what the next movie does, since they didn't even bother introducing him. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if they cut him all together, because, again, it's debatable how core he actually is, and if you have to time up afterwards, it feels weird. And uh, so the way they try and deal with that is also to try and beef him up. His presence is reiterated uh, a bit more and with a bit more depth. And as I said, they give expanded stuff for the princess. Specifically, they give her scenes with uh, Paul and with Fade that were not in the book. So to give us, uh, well, to give us some investment in the idea of her ending up with Paul as being something that could feasibly work, give her a little more agency in what's going on, and also to, as I said, beef up Fade a little bit. That latter part doesn't really work too well at all. The former, it works well enough, but the the scene does feel a little bit off, and, and I suspect because it is basically conceived out of whole cloth. Uh, as far as um, the other characters go, again, largely pretty well done. There are some odd little quirks here and there to the thing as a whole, though. So, like, for instance, this is going to be weird and nitpicky, but the the characters, or the actors, rather, in this movie do a very poor job of enunciating the difference between Mahdi and Muad'Dib. And you can already hear me saying that where they are very similar sounding words, but they have very keen different meanings and both get used pretty frequently in this movie. It's not a problem on the page because you see the way it's spelled and so you, you see that it's a different word every single time it comes up. But since they are audibly so similar, uh, I had a really hard time distinguishing which one was being said for a sizable chunk of the middle. Oh, I said most of the performances were okay. Honestly, kind of the exception on that is the biggest name in it, which is William Hurt, because he seems sedated. <laughs> I really get a strong feeling that, like, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to bother to look up what his career was doing overall at that point, but this feels like the kind of thing where his agent said, look, you're going to get top billing and you need to do something. You need to work. That is kind of the vibe that his performance brings. He's not terrible, because, like, he's William Hurt. He's got enough of an inherent presence that there is still a little there, but not much. 
And there are strange little weird moments. Like there's a one point where a, guild, a spacing guild member delivers out a line like this. And I have no idea why. And you can see where the budget dinged them a little bit because there's a bit in the middle trying to establish the Fremen campaign against the Harkonnens. And it's a lot of montage, which is the cheap way to get around it. But again, uh, I do understand why that would have been the case. But honestly, for what it is, understanding the inherent limitations of the budget that they had, this is not too bad. It's solid. It's not great. And there are some strange choices uh, or choices that even if I understand why they have it, it's like, well, that didn't, that didn't uh, quite pan out, did it? And uh, other than William Hurt, none of the performances really stand out as being exceptionally good or exceptionally bad. They are all serviceable. They get the job done. And that's kind of what this does overall. I'd certainly recommend it over the Lynch movie, but that's more for basically not dropping the ball, not because it does anything exceptionally well. So if you're comparing only those two, this is better more or less by default. Um, it's difficult to judge it against the new Dune because as I noted when I reviewed that, it was only half the story. So until we get the other half, it's hard to know how the adaptational changes or choices will affect the entire latter half of the thing. But as of right now, for the section that it did do, I think the new movie did it a bit better if for no other reason than the new one's a visual tour de force and it really brings across the environment a heck of a lot better than the miniseries could possibly do. But again, that's a little unfair. Understanding its restrictions is pretty good. But it ain't great. <laughs> oh, and what other random thing that bugged me? Look, it already annoyed me in the book that every single time Frank Herbert wrote about the Baron, he had to write about how fat he was, which was unnecessary after you've established it the first time. You know where you really don't have to keep pointing out how fat a guy is? In a visual medium when we can see him. When we can see him, we do not need characters to be later talking about the Baron and call him the Fat Baron. And that was unnecessary. Okay, that's it. That's my last thought. I think that was all of them. Ah, who knows? What are your thoughts on this miniseries? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Like, share, subscribe. I got a Patreon, which was how I was commissioned to do this entire run in the first place. You can support me in other ways at different tiers. There's rewards for everyone, but uh, no big pressure on that one. Take a relaxed attitude around here, so just come on back next time you need a break. And look at you. Sticking around through the credits, I appreciate that. Well, you know what? You're about to be treated to a whole ton of names going by on the screen, but there's a few of them that I want to give special attention to. My special thanks to Bookworm, Jared Boyce, MJ, Tracy Scrabbit, Vincent Paul Bartolucci, Kaylin Schwartz, Edelin, Hannah Acker, Robin Moore, Ross Schultz, and Shay Ligourle. If you want to hear me mispronounce your name, check out the reward tiers on the Patreon. But for right now, Thanks so much.